visit to Niger has been very fruitful and that, that it has opened an avenue to start talking. President Bola Tinubu receives report from ECOWAS Special Envoy to Niger Republic, General Abdul Salami Abdul We shall not spare any effort to protect the Nigerian worker and guarantee his dignity at all times. More ministers report for duty, read out policy priorities as they engage bureaucracy. The National Youth Service Corps resumes a orientation camp exercise in Brunu after 12 years. And on our program today, we shall take another look at President Tinibu's charge to ministers. All right, uh, the long wait for ministers is over. Cabinet constituted. Ministerial nominees confirmed by the Senate, inaugurated at Aso Brock Presidential Villa. And of course, the colorful event saw so ministers taking oath of office pledging to serve Nigeria with honesty, sincerity, and dignity. Well, that's right, Claire. And uh, this event, uh, which uh, comes up once or twice in the life of an administration, is no doubt a historic one that deserves uh, all that attention that's uh, accorded to it. And this is because the ministers themselves are key drivers of policies of the administration who are expected to give direction to the bureaucracy on what the government wants to achieve during its lifetime. Of course, and after the official inauguration and Mr. President's charge, many ministers have reported to duty at their various ministries, where they also took over affairs from the permanent secretaries. Equally, they gave their initial remarks stating their vision and mission in line with the renewed hope agenda of government. Shortly after, many of them were hosted to receptions by their families, friends and associates to celebrate the moment. But beyond these celebrations, there is work to be done. And the president was very emphatic on that, uh, saying that no excuses uh, will be accepted for failure to deliver on the renewed hope mandate to Nigerians. The ministers were charged to roll, roll up their sleeves, really, you know, and get to work in their various ministries, as Nigerians expect so much from them. Absolutely. And the president was very specific and emphatic on what he expects from the ministers. Among those things will include prioritizing the welfare of Nigerians and also ensuring that public faith in government, which is quite low at the moment, is fully restored. Now, the president also charged them to look beyond their region, religion, ethnicity, and other considerations and serve the general interests of Nigeria and Nigerians. Mr. President equally reminded the ministers to consider their appointment as a privilege to distinguish themselves towards projecting the values of accountability, honesty, efficiency, integrity, impartiality, and transparency. According to him, those who fail to perform may be subjected to remedial measures in order not to derail the renewed hope movement of which he is the driver. Indeed, and um, it, it would appear that the ministers took heed of Mr. President's charge very seriously, as many of them clearly indicated that they were out for business, not as usual when they arrived their respective ministries to meet with the management and heads of MDAs. Now, many of them have already given an indication of things to expect under their stewardship, and Nigerians are eagerly waiting. Yes, and yesterday on this program, that's Good Morning Nigeria, we started uh, interrogating the charge to the ministers by Mr. President, and he had, uh, we had guests who shared their perspectives about the mandate of the president uh, to the ministers and how they can live up to expectations. Today, we shall continue our conversation with another set of guests who are also vast in governance. I will also make their input to the subject matter. This is Good Morning Nigeria, live only on the network service of the NTA. I am Kirian Umar. I'm glad to be here and welcome you once again to this edition of Good Morning Nigeria.
Ma'am Claire Adelabu Abdul Razak, I'm sure if you watched us yesterday, um, you will recall that we spoke a lot about, uh, uh, of course, uh, ministers, uh, Kirian, who have been to the various ministries and, of course, uh, uh, given, you know, the hard knocks. Uh, one of those, of course, will be the minister of the FCT. And uh, this morning, you know, by, by this morning, he's had so many, you know, remarks, uh, uh, comments and reactions about his, uh, you know, uh, uh, meeting with the FCT administration. The important thing here, Claire, yes. is, look, you have been giving this mandate uh, by Mr. President. Mm -hmm. We want to see the performance. To hit, I wanted to hit gr the ground raw. Yeah, yeah, because yes, performance but is key. You know, we have also seen ministers in this country and uh, who made initial statements when they started but this time around i want to believe quite frankly that i'm going to do something very differently otherwise you know implementation has always been uh, you know the, the the real issue you know that brings about quagmire in our progress you know in the you past know, years you know yeah. um the 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 fct is you know uh very strategic i'm not particular yes. about the FCT. no no, no I'm, you know, I'm not talking <laughs> about you the fct uh, is very yeah. strategic not just because it is the federal capital, mm -hmm. but also because of you know agitations by the indigenous people uh, of, of 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 the territory, you know, to 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 be included in the act of governance. And uh, again, for the first time in a long while, uh, you know, someone from the south south will be in charge of uh, development here. And um, a lot of people have compared the uh, minister Yesowike with uh, former governor of Kaduna well, 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 and all that. But, <laughs> Okay. That's why I said, let's see what yes. I see. Uh, what, you know, what that was what's going to happen, yes. All right. We are all uh, expecting, of course, uh, uh, things to begin to happen. In the course of our program today, we shall also bring you highlights of the morning news. Now, there will be some business news as well. And then much later, Chooks the boy or the man will join us for a newspaper review. For now, let's have some comfort. That I'm willing to share. <laughs> Good morning, Thank Nigerians. You. All right, as efforts continue to, on seeking solutions to the political crisis in Niger Republic, President Bola Tinubu yesterday received reports of Ecos envoy led by former head of state General Abdul Salami, who visited the Nigerian military junta. President Tinubu, who is the chairman of the Ecos Authority of the Heads of State, and government received the former head of state and the president of ECOWAS Commission, Omar Turi, while the national secretary advisor, Nuhu Ribadu, also attended a meeting at the State House. I must say that the, our visit to Niger has been very fruitful, and that, that it has opened an avenue to start talking, and hopefully, um, we will get somewhere. Now, President Bola Tinubu has directed the Director General and Chief Executive Office of the National Identity Management Commission, named C. Aliu Abakar Aziz, to proceed on 90-day pre-retirement leave with effect from August 24, 2023, leading to his eventual retirement from service on November 24, 2023. And statement by Special Advisor to the President on Media and Publicity at Jurin Gilali indicates that the President approves the appointment of Bisoye Koka Udu Shote to serve as the Acting Director General and Chief Executive Officer of the Commission for a 90-day period with effect from August 24th this year, after which a full term of four years will begin as a substanti substantive uh, NIMC Director General and CEO beginning on November 24th, 2023. The President has also approved the appointment of Yusuf Buba Yakub as the director and chief executive officer of the Directorate of Technical Aid Corps. This follows the recent expiration of the tenure of the former DTAC director and CEO, Dr. Pius Osun Yikomi. These appointments take effect immediately. More ministers have resumed duty following their inauguration into the Federal Executive Council by President Bola Ahmed Tidubu. On the assumption of office, they all pledge high commitments towards good governance and socio-economic growth. To ensure that Nigerians get decent employment and, adequ and are adequately remunerated for their labor, 
both in public and private sectors. We shall not spare any effort to protect the Nigerian worker and guarantee his dignity at all times. Nigeria is looking forward to strengthening economic diversification to attract more foreign investment. Vice President Kashim Shaitima made the commitment when he visited the Gallagher Convention Center at the BRICS Exhibition Center holding in South Africa. The investments Nigerians are making in South Africa, this is a harbinger of greater things to come. Nigerians are active in the digital economy, they are active in passion, they are equally active in mining. I'm quite glad that quite a number of our countrymen are doing well. In the United Kingdom, British police say they have charged former Nigerian oil minister Deziani Alison Madwiki with bribery-related offences, saying they suspected she had accepted bribes in return for awarding multi-million pound oil and gas contracts. Alison Madwiki, 63, was a key figure in the administration of former President Goodluck Jonathan serving as petroleum minister from 2010 to 2015. She also acted as president of the organization of the petroleum exporting countries, OPEC, head of the National Crimes Agency's International Corruption Unit. Andy Kelly said the police suspected Deziani Alice Madwiki abused her power in Nigeria and accepted financial rewards for awarding multi-million pound contracts. These counts are a milestone in what has been a thorough and complex international investigation. The NCA said Alison Madwiki is being accused of benefiting from at least £100,000 in cash, chauffeur-driven cars, flights on private jets, luxury holidays for her family and the use of multiple London properties. We now turn our attention to Borno State, where Governor Babagana Umara Zulum has officially flagged off commencement of National Youth Service Corps orientation course in Maiduguri, halted for 12 years as a result of the insurgency. 1,225 corps members registered and took oath of allegiance to participate in the 2023 Badge B Stream 2 exercise for the service year holding in Maiduguri. The Borno State Capital. Director General of National Youth Service Corps, and also salute the courage of the core members for taking these bold steps to face the truth occasioned by the relative peaceful atmosphere of the state, despite flying fake news. And that's the news for now. Stay tuned for more on Good Morning Nigeria with Claire and Kirian on the tax ahead for the new ministers. All right, time to take a look at uh, business news, and for that, let's join Tokbe Alabi. Despite regular budget, Ajaokuta Steel Company is yet to commence full operations in over 42 years, with the federal government making failed attempts at privatization and concession while it allocates over 3 billion naira each year from 2016 to 2023 to cover personnel costs. The creation of the new Ministry of Steel Development underscored President Bolatino Bo's mandate in pursuing the nation's overall development particularly to harness its potentials for the country's industrial revolution. Minister of Steel Development Shuaibu Audu has affirmed his commitment to reviving the Ajaokuta plant in line with the renewed hope agenda of the president. Findings showed that Ajaokuta can produce steel for all machines from cars to aeroplane apart from producing required steel to develop infrastructures including rail, road, housing, military hardware and to support manufacturing companies. These experts noted will boost the country's foreign exchange earnings through exports and services. Working with finance, budget and planning, uh, whoever becomes the new CBN governor to ensure that we have a unique uh, fiscal policy that talks to 
how can we become an economy that produces not only goods but services that earn us foreign exchange. Research also showed that Nigeria can adequately solve its power problems as a Jakuta plant can generate electricity and the country's unemployment rate can drop to 1% through direct and indirect labor. As the largest metal and fabrication workshop in West Africa, experts say Nigeria's economy with the resuscitation of a Jakuta plant is on the verge of becoming becoming a global hub for foreign investments and industrialization. Let's take a look at Tuesday's proceedings on the floor of the exchange. With business news, I am Tokwe Alabi. Well, thanks uh, to me for the package. Next is a review of today's national dailies. All right, and uh, Chuk's the man is here. Chukwudi, good morning, and welcome to another day of newspaper review. I, I, I'm a grateful man unto, uh, uh, unto God this morning. I hope it shows on me. Absolutely. Hello, Kirian. Yeah, Chukwudi, I'm, I'm, I'm only glad to see you today. Mm, same here. Yeah. You know, you you know, from the disappearing act, I'm happy to see you back. Oh, yeah, great. 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 So let's uh, <laughs> turn to business. I've been he, super he's a, this he's, a pen, he's a pensioner, so uh, uh, he needs, he needs, <laughs> it doesn't, he needs yeah. some time off. It doesn't look it's, it. It's nice to yeah, be a well, oh, well, 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 senior it's nice to be a senior but, uh, citizen, you know. I mean, look, look at him. <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now we have two people. I have two people here, really. <laughs> Uh, the nation and the leadership is let me begin with the nation above the name flag government to curb rising inflation with cut in money supply uh, federal government states councils chair 996.1 billion as july allocation all that on page two of the nation stock exchange joins bid to boost forex uh, availability as a page two now, UK charged Disney with bribe taking and fraud. Ah, it's on page four. That's a big story there. Uh, president names Nancy Bowles. Uh, of course, uh, it's on page three. Medical consultant served to one day strike notice. It's on page three as well. Now, the, the, new, the lead story on the nation new twist in Niger crisis as Russian missionaries arrive. Wagner Group in Mali with arms and munition. Abu Salami raises dialogue hopes. Breeds Tinubu. Uh, you get all that gist on page two. Uh, minister zoom, ministers zoom into action. Badaru demands action plan to end terrorism. Weaker to directors. Move on if you can't perform. Uh, Tindu Joe said the uh, post borders passport scarcity must end. Omahi inspects Abuja Lukoja Road. All that uh, you can get on page four of the nation. Now, let me quickly run through leadership newspaper before Claire takes over. Perform or leave, we can tell FUTA, FCDA management staff. It's on page 20. UK police charge Daisy and Alice Marioka with bribery on page seven. Manufacturers query effect of rising public debt on production. It's on page seven. Cool. AU suspends Niger. Abdul Salami banks on diplomacy. You find that on page six. Now, the lead story on the leadership newspaper Defense ministers, service chiefs get one year to end insecurity. With three riders that our uh, jobs are at stake, says Badaru. Troops arrested nine over plateau attack and other crimes. Tinibu will tackle humanitarian crisis with clear cut policies. Betty Du says uh, the story is on page seven or page four actually. No project should exceed two years. Omahi declares. So page two. All trapped victims in Pakistan cable car rescued. On page fourteen, um, Tinibu appoints uh, Koka Dushote 
as uh, Nimsi DG is number 27. Claire. Yes, thank you. Uh, I will just uh, leave out the stories that you have read. I also have uh, some of them on the front page of The Punch. Uh, the Punch newspaper, and that would include uh, EU's uh, latest sanctions uh, on Niger, uh, and of course uh, the sharing of the July revenue and uh, the issue on Diziani. Uh, Kiran, <coughs> excuse me, had already <coughs> read out those. But the Punch is leading today with this story Anger at State's Warehouse Rise, Delay Palliatives Sharing. Again, Anger at state's warehouse rise, delay palliatives sharing. And they write us through that story. Bono distributes rise to 400,000 households. Workers lament hunger, demand relief, and labor insist 5 billion naira not enough. And Gumbi promises workers 10,000 naira, while Anambra is promising. 12,000 naira. And do you see the picture story accompanying those uh, um, uh, riders there? Borno State Governor Baba Gana Zulum during the distribution of food palliatives to 3,000 vulnerable residents of the state in my Sandari ward of Meduguri Metropolitan Council to reduce hardships caused by the removal of fuel subsidy in Borno State. And that was Tuesday, yesterday. And uh, of course, the picture shows a cross section of the recipients, the vulnerable residents of the state who are waiting for their share of the bags of rice from the state governor. Now, Kanu communities demand probe of abandoned FG Road, uh, it's on page 27. Associates man slain senators' aid, demand killers, killer soldiers' arrest. Yeah, you can read that up on page 4 and 5. And reps condemn auction of core members, abduction of core members, I beg your pardon, in Zamfara State. I'd just like to bring out this story from the inside page. You might not be able to see it. It's also on uh, the punch, uh, on the inside page of the punch. I don't know if uh, we all saw the story yesterday. It was, uh, uh, you know, televised. Police nab three vandals in Lagos, recover minibus, and those vandals, um, were uh, arrested for removing for removing um, two cards and bridge railings bridge railings i remember we talked about you know uh, these vandals and their very nefarious activities you know cutting away uh, railings manholes and and all that especially that on uh, uh, the new niger bridge very appalling uh, action there. Uh, Chukudi. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Claire. Um, let me start with it. You see, when I see anything that concerns the common man, uh, I always jump at it. You know, I'm a village man. I don't hide it at all. Forget it. I'm a farmer as well. Yes, I am a hunter as well. Yes. So, physically challenged street sweepers, that's coming from Lagos, are demanding better pay, better attention. Mm. And I, I dare say that uh, if uh, some of our brothers and sisters who are not too firm, you know, dare to get on the road with the broom to help us keep the environment clean, please, whatever they ask for, let us give it to them. It is quite daring for a man who is sitting on nerds that are not too firm, please, that's how I want to put it, you know, gets on the road. So they say they need more pay. I'm asking the Lagos State authorities to please look into it. And let other states... You see, Lagos, there's something about Lagos that I like. How many states have people who are not physically firm do uh, 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 allow people who are not physically firm to get on the road to sweep their streets? Lagos is daring, positively. And I like it. Let us uh, imbibe that attitude. Mm. They are saying here that gas shortage is deepening the nation's uh, power crisis. The 5,000 uh, megawatts ta targeted by the, uh, the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission, that's an e NERC, from July 1, to 2022, has been a cat and mouse, uh, mouse affair in terms of meeting the target. You begin to ask, what is the problem between 
4,000 megawatts and 5,000 megawatts. It's almost the same story <laughs> some six years ago, some eight years ago. Why can't we move past that threshold? And we have capacity for 7,000 megawatts. What is it we need to do? The new minister has some work to do. Even, Let us um, even the megawatts. I, I don't know that we we are powering. Mm -hmm. Have we been able to distribute them? Oh, okay, fine. That's a That's very a, good one. Yes. I remember. Thank God, Ajuri Ngelari is still in this uh, government. Uh, when it was uh, the Buhari era, mm. I remember him talking about the Siemens Nigerian Affair um, Agreement, which was supposed to enhance distribution. Uh, I'm sure journalists would like to take him up on uh, the continuity of that project because I keep on saying that what we need in this country is for continuity to always be assured, even if a party, a political party, that is different from the one leaving comes on board. Don't worry, Ajuri has promised to be with us uh, soonest on this he, program. He's coming. Yes, he, he, he has promised us um, when the time is right, uh, and that will be soonest. Wonderful. I would like to be around when it, it does come. Mm -hmm. So please, let's see how what we can do to without power. Just as we we're talking about steel yesterday, without power, what can you really achieve see, in an economy? For, for me. I mean, we've always said this on this program that uh, the issue that we have as, as a nation is the fact that when it comes to implementing projects, not just projects, but projects that, you know, is part of the NEF or if you like the nucleus of development mm -hmm. because power is central to everything you need to achieve. Yeah. See, if you stay like three months in Abuja, for instance, without power cuts, do you understand? People will make cars in this country. If you do that in coal camp in Inugu for six months, people will make cars there. You know, because, uh, because Nigerians have the capacity that we yes. always talked about. There have been measures on power. Yes. I recall when Fashola was in charge of power, we, we, there was expectations you know, that things are going to turn around. This story of 4,000, it's always been there. For decades, not to not say eight years, no, decades. We, 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 we have been around. You just keep gyrating yeah, around. Yeah, the same story and everything. It doesn't make sense. The same with the, with, with the with turn around maintenance for, 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 for our refineries. For decades, it was going to turn around, turn around. Yet, it is not functional. So, I mean, what are we talking about? We're talking about reality of purpose. If our people, people who are like, we're talking about ministers now, who have been given their portfolio, right? Fine and good. In some of them, I don't know the kind of portfolio they have for now. I'm going to do a study of that to yes. say, look, do we have round peg in round holes? Because it could take six months or more for you to even study and learn and understand the workings of a ministry. You know, if you don't have the, the wherewithal or prior knowledge of what to do, you start afresh. One minister here told us that he never knew about education until he was made education minister. So in that sense, I mean, what are you going to get from education? That must be the sports. You, you know, you know. know so, so these are the things that we keep talking about all I, so. I think, I think, while the issue of power generation and distribution is still being discussed or being um, uh, articulated, you know, for proper implementation, I think the talk now should be on gas. With with the kind of gas reserves that we have, and you know, efforts to um, to disseminate the use of gas, yes. you understand. I think we should concentrate on making it work. You know, gas yes. is the ultimate, apart from its eco-friendly, mm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, nature. It's a money spinner, and uh, I remember Kingsley would keep on harping on distributing the gas. I pray we're not going to hear in about a, a month from now that flooding is disturbing distribution because we we heard something like that last year we need to plan for gas even more than uh, 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 oil gas is the future we, we, we are more of a gas nation than than, than a petrol nation oh, I agree but with in you. terms of what we have yeah. in reserve trillions of cubic meters of gas that we have that we're not tapping and you're talking about plan we, see we have had about four national development plans in this country from the 60s to, 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 to today but these de development plans that we have which of them did we achieve even 60 percent that's what the problem is you know do you understand so you know gas has been there so who plans to deal with the gas that we have in abundance in abundance 
All right, so, on, so that's just the, the part of the issue that we have. Kiri yeah. Chukudi, thank you. Uh, we've come to the end of this uh, in review of the newspapers. Um, we can only talk about these issues. It's left for those, uh, uh, you know, given the responsibility to do, to, do the need, yeah. yes, to do the needful. Again, Chuck's the man. How are you doing? You bouncing. Ha ba have a bouncing oh, day. Oh, we give God the glory. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Uh, you uh, this all right, yeah. let's take a short break, and the program will continue in just a moment. All right, we thank you for staying with us up to this moment on Good Morning Nigeria. And to set the tone for our conversation on the show today, and that's on President Tinibu's charge to ministers. Let's take excerpts from guests on the same topic during yesterday's edition of our program. It is compiled by our correspondent, Joseph Olsen. There is a service you are to render, nothing more. So the driving of uh, big cars and uh, moving with siren is sometimes mistaken for what the office has to offer. That's number one. It's about service delivery. Number two, every minister in getting to his place should try to reactivate the Savicom office or desk. They are totally moribund, with all due respects to other views on the same subject matter. Um, Savicom ought to be the agency that reports that for this money spent in this ministry, we are convinced Nigerians are well served. We were all in government when the entire thing came around on the Obasanjo. So they should reactivate the Savicom office. They should also reactivate the Transparency Monitoring Unit. So if there are any irregularities, that unit should be among those EFC, CIC, PC should call. Even the issue of territorial control is not going to be part of this Mr. President agenda. Oh, this is exclusive for me. This is not. No, I think this is a new norm. We expect that ministers should be able to reach out to their colleagues where they have some, you know, senior, so some relationships like agriculture and water resources, like the emerging innovation in the blue marine and blue economy, transportation, they have to work together. There will be no need for competition. There will be no need for rivalry. Gone are the days where ministers and ministers of state don't see eyeball to eyeball because there is the claim that one is the boss and the other one is just following. No, Mr. President has charged them. You have to work as a team. For example, in the Ministry of Health today, there are theater nurses that are better than doctors. Yes, exactly. Because they have been there for a long time. 25 years uh, experience, 30 years experience, and you come because you are the medical doctor. We respect you, but there are theater nurses that would say no. Uh, doctor, if you do this, if you perform this operation on this, it will not work this way. And they know. So yes. you have to leverage on the experiences of people like that. It's not the president, if the president is to do everything, uh, then he will collapse. Yes. Definitely he will collapse. If the minister needs to do everything, he will collapse. The agencies in the ministries are the live wire of the ministries. Mm. It is not even the parent ministry. It is the agencies that give life to the ministry. All right, we just listened to excerpts from the conversation yesterday on President Tinubu's charge to ministers compiled by our correspondent Joseph Otsen. Joseph, thank you. Now, to discuss uh, the part two uh, of this topic, we have uh, here with us in the studio the former governor of Kano State. He's also a former minister of education, former senator. His Excellency, Madam Ibrahim Shekrao. Good to see you, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure being here again. Yeah, after a long time. <laughs> exactly. All right, also here in the studios with us, uh, we have the, um, uh, we have Honorable Gloria Okolubo. Uh, she is also former commissioner for multilateral relations and energy in Delta State. Good Thank morning. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good Kamid. morning. It's a pleasure. Okay, um, uh, I want to introduce also 
uh, Ibim Seminitari. I hope I got that correctly. He's a former commissioner for information River State and former MD NDDC. Madam, correct me if uh, I got it wrong, uh, your son. Maybe. We're glad to have you join us this morning on the program. Thank you, Kirian. Okay. And thank you, Claire. Oh, oh, great. So, uh, so let's uh, get this conversation started. We, 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 we had the, the first segment yesterday, and our topic is happening on the charge by Mr. President uh, to the ministers whom he has uh, given portfolios. You know, you, you, you have vast experience in all of this as a former governor who was in charge of commissioners, you know, uh, to, the, uh, to implement your policies in all ramifications and in all facets of, uh, you know, uh, human life. It affects your ministers then. Then you were a senator as well, you know, made laws and knows what it means to implement budgetary implementation and budgetary allocation or whatever. All of these, uh, you know, are uh, encompassed in, in governance. Yeah. Now, how would you advise the uh, current ministers you know, who have uh, just uh, been uh, given portfolio? You know, some of them may not have even uh, worked in a public, uh, you know, environment in the, mm. in the before. That's true. Uh, they may That's require true. some tutelage you know, to be able to cope mm. with the pressure mm. of uh, the implementation and all of that. Mm. So, what would you be telling them? You know, and uh, what is also assessment of uh, their capacity, you know, to deliver on the new hope? Well. Uh, I think uh, first and foremost, uh, if anyone gets to be appointed as a minister, uh, the most important thing is identify what were the expectations of the president. Uh, the president is representing the entire nation and uh, of course he came in on a platform of a given political party and uh, he had made some promises and the party has some uh, manifesto to achieve certain goals so i expect all ministers of this president uh, to really uh, expose themselves to what were the priorities of Mr. President. That's one. Number two, uh, the priorities and objectives of the very ministry to which we have been assigned. Uh, if I take, for example, my own constituency, if you are sent to be a minister of education, uh, you may not necessarily have to be an educationist. But at that level, we are expected to really comprehend and understand what objectives of a given agency is. Uh, you don't just come in and start giving instruction left, right and center. If, for example, the objective of Mr. President is to increase enrollment in schools, and you come to the ministry, uh, it's not just a matter of uh, uh, going around, giving out contracts, construction craft, classrooms, and so on. When you have to identify what are the objectives of the ministry, what is there on ground, what is the current population, what, is the, what are the challenges, and secondly, uh, source of funding. If, for example, you, you, the president challenges you that you have to give 1,000 classrooms in the year, you look at the budget, and you find that uh, if it takes you five million to construct a classroom and uh, to do a thousand classroom that will require about 500 million and you discover that in the budget of five, uh, about five billion and uh, you have just only 200 million in the budget. So you have to cut corners and identify uh, what are your priorities. So on the whole, my uh, suggestion is that they should take some time to study the operations on ground, the operations of the ministry, what is on ground, what are the objectives, what is the source of funding, and identify the appropriate personnel. To uh, that's the ground. scenario you painted now. Yeah. If you have a project yes. to say that will take like 100 million, yeah. and uh, you, you, you have 
uh, an allocation mm -hmm. of uh, maybe 20 percent of that yeah. and the president expects you to achieve his objective yes. how can it work is it part of the reason why we have always had issues with implementing policies of government mm. Kieran well, I, th I think um, uh, we'll just uh, put uh, the uh, his excellency on hold for a while okay. uh, just uh, ponder you know over the questions he's just raised we'll, co we'll come back to it in just in just a moment let's bring in a former commissioner for information uh river state that's uh, ibim seminatari uh to you know also make some contribution and um yesterday on this program if we have uh, uh mr seminatari on uh you know gets to look at various aspects you know of the president's charge and um, issues such as uh, uh, intelligence, rivalry, mode of leadership, uh, you know, to be pre uh, presented by Mr. President, uh, how the ministers, of course, should go about, uh, you know, carrying out, implementing, you know, the mandate and uh, quite a number of issues. But I'd like you to speak on this particular charge, which, you know, many Nigerians say is very critical and, you know, important if the ministers uh, to achieve the objectives and the uh, uh, renewed hope agenda. And that's the charge from the president on ethnicity, religion, uh, party, uh, you know, uh, uh, and region. He said the ministers should not see this appointment from those perspective, but from the perspective of Nigeria. Now, uh, from your perspective, this is, um, is this an uphill task? it ought to be an uphill task for anyone in public office. I mean, one of the biggest challenges we faced uh, as a nation is that we look at our country through the prism of these things, and it really doesn't work. There was a time in Nigeria when it really didn't matter um, where you were from, what religion you were. I mean, I went to a federal government college, and one of the things we pride ourselves in, we say our blood is green, because we grew up as young people just loving each other and trying to be um, from from Nigeria, not from any ethnicity. We did not, we had in our school library, we had the, li the Bible, we had the Quran, and um, we understood each other. We, we spoke uh, literally in the same language, and which was having a heartbeat for Nigeria. And this is what the president has asked the, pre the ministers to do, and something that is critical. Anybody who is going to be a minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria has to be a minister for everyone, um, regardless of where the, the person is from. And anybody who's going to be a minister for this country has to want to serve every region of the country, because that is the only way we can renew hope for Nigerians. Nigerians are really looking for hope. Uh, and literally what these ministers can do is restore confidence and show that every Nigerian actually believes in their country again, believes in government again, believes that government is there to serve the people and not to serve their own interests. So I don't think it's an uphill task. I think it really is what public service ought to be. And uh, the president's charge is right at this time. Against the background uh, of, you know, um, reactions uh, about some ministers, you know, uh, for instance, the FCT minister for, you know, now, and um, he's from the South South and he's minister of the FCT. Um, and he's come out with some very strong words, you know, for, you know, uh, those uh, in the FCT. So how, how easy will it be for the minister now to begin to implement, you know, um, the agenda, the infrastructure agenda and all the things that he says he will do? Well, um, I do hope that we will see uh, boots on the ground and actions. Um, and that's because really for every Nigerian, the FCT is um, our if you like it's it's our it's it's our flagship it shows off our country and who we are um at least i listened to the minister of the fct and basically what i think i hear him say is some some aspect of 
of restoring the, the beauty of the FCT. He talked about ensuring that the development uh, plan of the FCT um, goes back on track. He talked about the master plan. Uh, and I think that, yes, Abuja deserves um, some order. I hope that part of what he's going to look at would be the transportation network going forward, because that's something that the, 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 the FCT could use. Um, how's he going to be linking the satellite towns? That's something I'm sure he should look at. Yes, development control is important, but making life easier for residents of the FCT is something I hope he does. Another big thing that the FCT would benefit from is um, economic reforms. Uh, and I believe that this, this, you know, how can we make uh, the FCT work for the private sector? Yes, it is government. There's a lot of government in the FCT, but how will small time people and small time businesses exist? Uh, and I hope that part of what the FCT minister will do, uh, if I listened and if I heard him right, would be a development that allows infrastructure work for the people. Um, I, I know that he spoke a lot about control, he spoke a lot about restoring the master plan, but I hope in addition to that, he will focus on, on delivering to the, to every resident and every Nigerian actually who looks up, up to the FCT as, as its model of, of, model city of choice. Um, can he do the things he's promised? One of the things I can say, I mean, just looking at the work he's done in River State, is that he is big on infrastructure, is that he does uh, uh, try to deliver on infrastructure. So I expect to see um, a face, the face of the FCT change for the better. Um, and again, I'm looking at his track records. Don't forget that this minister has served as local government chairman and was best performing local government chairman twice uh, when he served in River State. He also, as governor, won, um, you know, was was vote was considered or named by the former president who was in the opposition to him as um, uh, best state governor with regards to projects. So I'm sure we will see infrastructure development in the FCT that I, I think we can guarantee. Now he needs to look beyond that uh, and deliver on the economy uh, as regards the FCT. Uh, uh, thank you indeed. Um, um... You know, you, you have experience as a former uh, MD, NDDC. So I want to believe that uh, you're synonymous with, uh, with uh, development. Um, uh, um, as a matter of fact, uh, the weekend that uh, you talked about um, has uh, been a man known for, you know, development. But again, uh, FCT has a lot. You know, Abuja floats a lot. You know, there are things that need, need to be done apart from infrastructure. You know, there are basically needs. Water, for instance, you know, should be regular. You know, I mean, Abuja and this environment. But that, that's not being specific. But there are other ministries that we're also concerned about. So let's come back to the studio. And uh, I, I, I'd like to uh, go to Gloria Okolubo, a former commissioner for multilateral relations and energy. I was just wondering. <laughs> what that meant, Commissioner for Multilateral Relations and Energy. You know, why I'm highlighting that is because, one, you're, you were a commissioner in a, on the government, and I'm sure you have come across policy implementation. You must have achieved one thing or the other. And now we are talking about ministers who have just been appointed. Some have not been in public service in the past, in their lifetime, uh, because they are politicians, they are there. Um, when uh, 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 former Governor uh, Shekarao was talking, you know, he said, look, that uh, you must not be an educationist, for instance, to be a uh, minister of education, because your target is to achieve the objective of, of the president. Because, and again, we've had uh, former minister of education saying he didn't know any much about education when he became education. But I don't know how well he performed, actually. But the important thing here is this. Do you think we have good crop of men and women you know who can drive this country and do things unusually because if they go back to what happened in the past we may achieve continue to achieve same result thank you so much i was a commissioner multilateral relations and the buja office that was one portfolio mm -hmm. then i was thereafter appointed commissioner energy the first woman to and i was not an engineer Good. But I ran that office and I was able to go and sign MOUs on behalf of the government. I had done enough research. I had come into government from civil society Great. and I had developed myself. So for those who are greenhorns who have just come in from other sectors, there were people who came in after um, 
several years of, you know, service. We, we saw their CV when they were being presented to the Senate. It's your capability and your ability to apply yourself mm -hmm. to the portfolio that you have been given and yeah. your experience. I see quite a number of people who have experience from government on board already. It's a little bit embarrassing to hear a, uh, somebody say he didn't know anything about education before he became a minister of education. Because um, even as an educated person, your ability to apply yourself to the mandate that your government has given you is what will guide you in policy making and your ability to be in touch with the people on ground it's very important it's easy to forget it's easy to get away with the glamour and the trimmings of the office and forget the situation in the country right now we are in dear need of governance we are in dear need of development and uh, we have gone beyond politics People must realize that politics is completely over. We are in the season of governance. People are actually hungry on the streets. People are hungry for development. West African region is in trouble. We have more military governors and incursions everywhere. And this is not the time. If the ministers fail, the government fails. We thank God that as at now, we have a president who is not doing a blame game. He has said he came ready for the job. He came ready prepared he lobbied he campaigned he even did everything for the job and he is ready for the job and if the ministers take a cue from that stance and put their uh, put boots on the ground like my sister said from Port Harcourt then they should be able to sit down work with competent teams you have aides you know that you're supposed to work with in choosing their aids they must be very careful it's not about who is from my village or who is from my my um, um, whatever it's about how do i deliver on my mandate for instance we see moves on the part of this government to do something unique with the blue economy we also have the green economy if we have the capacity to generate power to the tune of about 260 megawatts thousand megawatts you know, from alternative sources. We have to sit down and say, people, we have, the government team has to sit down. They have to realize that there are in times when they cannot give an excuse. There is no room for excuse. And in New York City, I, my sister dwelt a lot on it. I'm a Niger Delta Indian resident in Abuja. I've spent over 20 years cumulatively in Abuja. Even while I served as Commissioner Multilateral, I was stationed in Abuja. So I'm an Abuja Indian from uh, Niger Delta extraction. So we welcome development in FCT. There's so much work to be done. It's not a joke. We don't have nights in FCT. Niger Delta uh, Ministry has been turned to Niger, Del uh, Niger Delta um, Commission. It's now uh, a major data ministry, ministry. now development. The, it's not just a name change. It's the Ministry of Niger Delta Development. We don't want to just see a name change and business as usual. It's very important and pertinent for us to re re realize, for the ministers to realize that a lot is expected of them. Development in every sense of the word is expected of them. They have to sit down, strategize, and know what to do. The economy is another aspect. I could go on and on, but I'm sure... Why do you think the policy... Because every government we've had had policies, yet implementation of these policies... And so, for instance, you, oh, oh, right, from, 20, from 1999, we've been doing this. And you can't tell me you never formed a good government, never had good policies, never had good, good, good personnel in terms of ministers and, and, and key, key, uh, key uh, policy implementers as MDs of agencies and CEOs of uh, ministries and agencies. Now, the, the results are just there. Why, why, why do you think it's so? Policy is supposed to be, governance and policies implementation is supposed to be incremental. And we're also supposed to have been building institutions not personalities that's why i said people should not get carried away with the glamour but the issue the work they have on their desk you must implement policy in such a way that you take off from where you met and it's like pedagogy in learning you have to find out what the person knows and then from there you build further knowledge or you make the person unlearn mm -hmm. and relearn mm -hmm. before you build further knowledge 
Governance is incremental. And so it's not about the person that is sitting on that seat. It's about looking at the policy of the government, looking at it in context of your particular portfolio, and ensuring that you begin to implement those policies in such a way that you are building on the institution. And so the next person that takes off from you works on that and builds on it. You cannot be on the part of you know, um, saying you want to insist, for instance, in energy, on doing renewable energy, you know, and, you know, developing the green economy, and then somebody comes the next season and throws and that policy completely away and goes right back because of probably the, the, the merits of, you know, importing generators and all that, and takes us like how many years back. You know, so it's about understanding the rudiments of governance and really saying to yourself, I want to make a difference. I want my generation to remember me for something. So that's the charge I actually have for the okay. ministers this morning. Comrade Gloria Okolubo, thank you. Understanding the rudiments of uh, government. Your Excellency, uh, again, Mr. President was emphatic to the ministers. Go and restore, you know, uh, confidence in government, Nigerians' confidence in government, that would mean the ministers have to think out of the box to do things unusual, move away from business, you know, as usual. Now, from your perspective, from your experience, you know, how can the ministers navigate between personal interest, party interest, and public interest? I think the bottom line is the issue of sincerity. Being sincere, being honest. This is why it's called public service. Personal interest, party interest should take the back seat. Uh, that is something every public officer in Nigeria uh, promises to do when they take an oath before either the president or the governor. So the ministers are not, they're not newbies actually uh, some of them may be new uh, to being ministers but none of them is actually a newbie many of them have been ministers before many have served as governors as senators so i expect that this is an opportunity for them to leave a legacy this is an opportunity for them to reassure nigerians so it's really really important that personal interest party interest ethnic interest religious interest take the back seat and Nigerian interest takes the front seat. Um, the Nigerian people must be at the fore of what these ministers are doing uh, this time around. Uh, Mr. President has spoken well in asking them to restore confidence in governance. And you will agree, Claire, that um, very, very, very honestly, uh, confidence in the Nigerian government had whittled down. Many people had lost hope. Many of our people really just look at anyone in public of office, uh, me inclusive, and say, what are they coming to do again? It's just another jamboree. They're coming to just make money, you know. Um, so the ministers have their work cut out for them, whether you're in water resources or you're in power. Now, it will be a great thing to see the Minister for Power actually move beyond the traditional 3,000 megawatts or 2,000 and give us actual electricity because this is what will help uh, ensure that manufacturing works. It will be important to see uh, the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs actually go beyond um, tokenism or beyond us seeing uh, um, envelopes giving out here and there, but actually take care of a lot of the humanitarian crisis happening in, 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 a, in many of our conflict regime so, zones. It would be great to see the Minister of Niger Delta go beyond being Minister of the NDDC and actually the minister of the Niger Delta. Um, so these are the kinds of things we want to see happen. Uh, not a minister who decides that, which is the most lucrative agency, I'm going to just put my pipe there and suck. Uh, frankly, that is not going to cut it. Uh, and I hope that just as Mr. President has appointed them, if there's any minister who's not living up to their billing, um, he would just not wait too long to ask them to Please excuse us, we have work to do. Um, he wants to create hope in Nigeria, and it's important that his frontline men show hope. As I mentioned earlier, I had the experience. You ran NDDC, 
And let's take a, a look at not NDDC but particularly, but Niger Delta, for instance, where you also come from. We had Minister of Niger Delta. We had we have NDDC all targeting development of that geographical area. But again, if if you look at the you know antecedents of what happened in the past. I am not sure that, uh, you know, uh, there has been a restoration of public confidence in either NDDC or Minister of Niger Data, for instance. Yet we have, we have, we have had eminent, prominent personalities who handled positions of authority in that place. And we have had also contracts awarded, contracts are not yet implemented, some have been implemented, and, and what have you. I, 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 I can tell you that some people grew up knowing about East West Road, for instance, and what have you. The story is still on, just like you say, uh, Legacy by the Expressway, or you say, Port Harcourt Enugu. These are rules that have been there for decades and done and uncompleted. And so we, we, we are still we're, 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 we're looking at a situation where we don't repeat those things again because we have them on record and, and all that. So. I, I wanted to take some, you know, tell us more about what could be done to avert a reputation of what we have seen over the years. And I, I don't know where you are, if you can have a little bit more light on your face, uh, that would be okay, you know, so that uh, you could be properly seen. Um, I hope you could just uh, do the adjustment. Unfortunately, I'm not in a studio um, and I have, uh, I, I don't know if I can do much more about the lighting. I apologize for that. Um, but very quickly to, to what you've talked about. Yes, indeed, I agree with you that the, there's been um, some failure uh, with regards to delivery to the Nigerian people and especially to the people of the Niger Delta. Um, I don't know if I'm in a good position to speak, having been an active player myself, uh, serving as acting MD of NDDC, but I guess there are a few insights I can give. And it's the fact that, um, again, the, the, the Niger Delta De Development Commission has a mandate, not just to build infrastructure, but to advise the federal government with regards to issues in the Niger Delta. And when you say advice, if you look at the act that sets up the NDDC, it includes advising each ministry, uh, each federal ministry, on what they can do uh, with regards to development in the Niger Delta uh, sector by sector. Now, is that mandate being achieved or is anybody even listening? That is not happening. Part of what the NDC is supposed to do is also to advise Mr. President and to present an annual report to Mr. President as to its activities. I cannot speak for others, but when I served as ND, every quarter, I delivered a report that showed what we had received, what we had spent, what what contracts were being done, status of each contract. Now, there are a lot of contracts that should just be terminated, but there is a process to contract termination. Part of the problem is every new person who comes wants to award new contracts. And that is because there's a lot of politicization of the NDDC. And a lot of the players, and this is not just the politicians, this is literally everybody, you know, from the person on the streets in the village who has said that the NDDC is his oil well, to the, to the chiefs, to the politicians, to everybody. So perhaps we should even deal with the mindset of every Nigerian when they see an agency of government. As they say, it is arise, eat, kill, and eat for everybody. Uh, but that's a conversation for, for the day. What I would like to see, and I hope that the Minister of the Niger Delta goes beyond, and that's why I said he's got to go beyond being Minister of NDDC. Somebody becomes Minister of Niger Delta Ministry, forgets that there are other issues to deal with. He goes to the NDTC and decides that this is a, this is a plug, plug whatever pipe you have there and drain the NDDC. That's not why he's appointed or she's appointed. You've talked about the East-West roads and, and it, is, it is annoying that till now that road has not been fixed. But that is not something that is in the Ministry of Niger Delta or I mean, that is in the NDTC. That has moved from Ministry of Works to Ministry of Niger Delta to which other ministry? So is this something the president wants to look at and insist that is done? Because the ministers also report to the president. Um, so I agree with you, but Nigerians must hold our ministers accountable. What are we doing, whether as people from the region or as the media, to make those things front burner issues and to demand action?
Perhaps that, that's also something we should ask ourselves. Governance is in a democracy is really beyond just whoever is appointed. It is the people, it is the legislature, it is the judiciary. So it's everybody. And all of us must insist that those who are appointed as ministers do their work. Thank you for your thoughts. Uh, back to the studio, comrade uh, Gloria Kulubu. Uh, um, um, I'd like you to also look at uh, that issue um, on, on, you know, restoring confidence in uh, public confidence in government. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis how these new ministers can, you know, marry, put aside their personal interests and, you know, uh, party interest and other interest. I'll start by saying that um, the politics, like I said before, is over. If you look at the FCT, for instance, the new FCT minister is coming from another party entirely. And for me, it's a thing of joy to see that it is by way of, I'm not talking about any other thing aside from performance, by way of performance and track record, he is one of the best from this last dispensation by way of infrastructure. And so we look forward, you know, albeit with caution, we look forward to proper development of, e of um, FCT by way of infrastructural development, creating an enabling environment for the uh, private sector, for business to thrive, and for infrastructure that works for the people to be put in place in the FCT. Those are some of the things. It's not just about, you know, facing the issues that are political or being seen. The ministers must instill themselves from the politics of the day. They must make sure that they build the confidence of Nigerians. To say that Nigerians lack confidence in governance is an understatement. Nigerians are tired. They just talk about the fact that we are just recycling the same old politicians. If you go out there, you hear it. You cannot say you don't hear it. So we are on a confidence-building mission. Every minister should know that they are on a call. And you're going to be assessed by your, on your own. There were other governors during the last dispensation. Wiki was assessed by the work he did in Port Harcourt. And even a blind person, even in an MP, a, APC government, he was given an award based on the work he put in and, and, in and, 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 Port Harcourt. I'm sure you're, 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 you're... Particular about the FCT, I mean, it's because a, I'm in, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but also, confidence <clears throat> would also have to do with how you manage crisis, absolutely, how you manage the labor unions, absolutely, because that was the first uh, uh, area that the president touched, yes, dealing with you know minimum wage issues, issues with labor, you know, how you distribute uh, palliatives and all that, and that was that was to uh, the Minister of Labor and Employment, that's uh, right Honorable Simon Bakuladon, how can he manage this responsibility? Well, I think uh, coming to the issue of government vis-a-vis -vis relationship with the labor, uh, unfortunately, is the same problem of lack of confidence. Uh, and uh, not only lack of confidence, you see, the trust, the openness, uh, if I may immodestly mention my own uh, instance, the very week I was made Minister of Education uh, in 2014, I met an 11-month-old strike by all polytechnics and colleges of education. <laughs> but we solved it within one week. I invited the leadership, we sat down, we opened our mind, I, we, I, I gave them all the respect, we discussed, I said, what was the problem? They listed all the problems, and I agree with them. All the issues they raised were correct, and identified with them. You see, the problem is most people in government, when there are issues from the labor, they think that they are challenging the personality of the people in the office. And uh, from that point, they lose the confidence. You don't listen to them. You don't identify with them. That government must always be right. No. We agreed with them. We sat there. I said, all of these problems you have listed didn't start last year, didn't start yesterday, didn't start two, three years ago. So it is you and I and the ministry that will work together and the government to solve all of these problems. What, 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 qualities, so, what qualities do you think uh, will be 
uh, desirable for uh, you know a personality that no 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 I think yes. the minister must be humble the minister must be very understanding he must really embarrass all of his staff if you take minister of education there are 16 department directors 23 pastors you need to bring them on board but if you come as a boss, you know it all, you are there to insist and to direct, and it's only you that will give the directives, then everybody will just fold his hand and say, okay, uh, let's see how you behave, because you have come with almighty ministerial appointment. So I think the ministers must be humble enough, must really come down to the level of the ministry that he finds and invite all the staff, give them all the confidence, and allow what we call the due process. Okay. Uh, uh, um, due process allowing the people in government and people in office to do their role, to participate. But if you just come from your table and you want to discuss and you want to dictate, as a governor, for example, I've never given any contract right from my desk. We always go to council and discuss, and everybody in the commission, in the council, feels part of it. And when you go, the staff will be your witnesses. The records will be there. They will be participating. Yes, uh, uh, former Senator uh, Malam Ibrahim Shekhar, I'm going to remain with you because no. uh, of your experience as governor of Kano State. That's right. Now, you know, what about agriculture? We, we seem not to have, uh, you know, uh, continued, you know, the trajectory of uh, raising agriculture, raising the bar of agriculture. The, the immediate past government did something differently, you know, that led to uh, some level of uh, sufficiency in terms of uh, rice production and perhaps other crops and, and, and all that, but we are, it's not yet to guru with agriculture. Why do you think we have failed in agriculture as part of a diversification process of even the good luck administration, then Buhari administration, all geared towards, uh, you know, uh, 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 giving oil uh, a little gap, you know, getting something newly done. Many countries like Indonesia, you know, who is the son or are you producing nation? Forgot about oil over 40 years ago and diversified its economy. And today they're into manufacturing, they're into production. In superstars, in, in, in Jakarta, for instance, you can hardly find any product in superstars coming from any, any other country apart from Indonesia. That is progress made in terms of agriculture and other. So, what has held us back? From yeah. Green Revolution mm. and other, you know, implementable but never well implemented, you know, you know, you know, projections of administration we have in the past. I think uh, along the line, I think whether it was you or my sister Gloria that mentioned the the lack of continuity in governance. You see, everybody coming on board, whether the president, the governors, or at the local government level, uh, this has been our problem. There is no continuity in governance. Even sometimes, even within the same party, you'll be surprised that uh, I've been giving examples. Uh, Basanjo had uh, a policy of a certain vision. When Jonathan came, the same party, he came on to his transformation. When Eradua came, he came with a seven point agenda. You see, even within the same party, there's no continuity. And that's part of the problem. As long as you don't have the uh, uh, political stability in terms of governance, in terms of continuity, that has affected not only agriculture, many other sectors. So in agriculture, another problem is that we, 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 we really don't have synergy even between the states. If you take agriculture, for example, uh, Kano, the same agricultural uh, situation of Kano, Jugawa, Kaduna, Katsena. But there is no collaboration, there is no working together. If I go out of this country to solicit and uh, invite investors, I'll be talking about the hectares in Kano. If Kaduna goes out, you'll be talking of the hectares in Kano. But if there is a coordination of millions of hectares of a given crop, big time investors will come. In agricultural policies, uh, Jigao doesn't know what Kano is doing, Kaduna doesn't know what Kasena is doing, Zafara doesn't know what Kano is doing, Cross River doesn't know what Rivers is doing. We are so independent on all of these things. I think uh, the business of the government at the center is the ability to coordinate all of this and try to have a common policy. This so-called constitutional independence of the state is part of our problem. 
Yes, of course, we are independent. Uh, the president doesn't direct governors what to do, but there must be some idea. The federal government business is about national policy. If the national policy of uh, mass food production, for example, is the issue, the federal government should be able to take along the states into this, and the states should understand and cooperate so that we all move into the same direction, the policies will be the same, this was what gave the success to the furious government in the parliamentary system of the regional governments. Uh, even tree planting in the northern region. The same policy in Bidda will be the one in uh, Adamawa, will be the one in Kanwa, will be the one in... Because the central regional governments were doing it. And we made a lot of progress. So now but you're talking about uh, synergy. Synergy, yes. There's also lack of synergy yeah. between agencies yeah, exactly. or parasitas yes. under a ministry. Exactly. The ministry has an objective, but with various uh, you know, uh, agencies. Mm -hmm. And that's like a coordination between the MD of uh, uh, agency A and MD of agency B. In some cases, you, 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 you see them you know, uh, 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 doing similar... I believe it's the failure of the head, the political head, the ministers. That's yes. part of the challenge. Mm -hmm. The ministers should be able to bring all the agencies to the table to understand that we are working toward the same goal. If I may cite, for example, very embarrassing the previous government, uh, Police Service Commission mm -hmm. and the IG were in court. Mm -hmm. I said, look, what, 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 what the hell? In fact, it's, it's so embarrassing. The same agency, the same government, the same purpose. The purpose is to produce capable, recruit capable policemen. And so you find that that's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Even within the same ministry, if the minister is not able, that's why I said you need not to be a specialist in the particular ministry that you have been sent to. We've had examples. Uh, Professor Jibril Aminu, uh, who was uh, a medical doctor, did very well in Ministry of Education, did very well in Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, in spite of the, that, the fact that he was a medical doctor. Yes, so I think his ability to coordinate. Ex excellent uh, examples you have yeah. given, of course, uh, yeah. gone from your experience. And I'd like you to extend uh, yeah. this uh, piece of experience to you know, two ministries, okay. humanitarian ministry yeah. and labor. Yeah. And that's because of the current situation uh, that Nigerians you know, find themselves in at the moment. Yeah. We know what is happening you know, with the removal of subsidy, yeah. and we know what is happening with, of course, uh, government declaration of palliatives. Just this morning, the newspapers are carrying that the NLC yeah. is kicking against you know, the 5 billion naira palliatives you know, declared by government. So it's, it will seem that all the unions, recently, of course, we know ASU, mm -hmm. ASU, you know, went mm -hmm. on. Protracted strike. Pro very stupidly. Protracted strike. We had the recent, just recently resident uh, doctors on strike. You know, it, it's like these unions at the moment can be described as you know sleeping dog. So they they just lying waiting for you know time to strike. Mm -hmm. What experience, given yeah. your background, yeah. do you give? to the Minister of Education, yeah. Minister of Labor, yeah. and the Humanitarian Affairs Minister. I think the bottom line, as I said, you, you bring the unions close and uh, sit together with them. We've had instances where Ministers of Labor will be abusing the Labor uh, officers, which is wrong. Bring them, sit them on the table. You see, the problem is that if my earning is 20,000, and you're asking me to give you ten, I mean, 30,000 salary. You think I'm not telling you the truth. By the time we open up the truth, and you are convinced that my earning is 20,000, you should not be asking of 30,000. That's what I did with the union. And we met on a Thursday. We were sworn in on Wednesday. We met on Thursday. By Monday, they call off the strike. I went to Jonathan. And I, he was convinced that, look, Let's work together with this union. But when you try to do the bossy thing and you don't want to... And my appeal to the new Minister of Labor is that he should see himself as part of them. Uh, not just the government and the union. I told the NUT that, look, if you're on strike, as a minister, I'm also on strike. It's my business to make sure lessons continue. So it's the business of the Labor Ministry and the humanitarian 
and education, bring these labor people. There is a very wide gap of lack of trust in between. And I think they are Nigerians. They are part of them. The labor leader today could be the minister tomorrow. And uh, they, they need to understand the situation and the truth of the government. I'm sure no labor union will be taken along from my experience. I was a very active, I was the national president of principals of secondary schools for four years, between 1988 to 92, and I was in the executive of the NUT. So we, we know all of these things. The ego of the labor is give them the trust, bring them on board, discuss with them, open up the truth. But when they see that uh, you say your earning is 20,000, but they discover that your earning is 50,000, and uh, you, 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 are, you are telling lies. You see, when you see minister's life style, uh, lifestyle is beyond the truth okay. of what is going on. People in government, so the society don't believe them. You yeah. say the treasury is lean, yeah. but you're looking fat and well, uh, living I, I, well. <laughs> We also used to have That's a, corruption. We also used to have a zero, a, a zero a, allocation. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 Lord government chairman will tell you that he has zero allocation. Yet he's living in affluence. I mean, he's riding this convoy. Is the and, that and is all the whole thing. So that is the whole thing. That's the whole thing. All right. On that note, uh, we'd like to uh, appreciate you once more and thank you for sharing your time and your thoughts with us this morning and your wealth of experience. Uh, former governor of Kano State, former minister of education, and from a senator, His Excellency Malam Ibrahim Shakarao, we thank you. We hope to see you again on this platform when we'll engage you, perhaps, on another. Thank you topic. very much. Thank All you. right. Thank you. And uh, it is said that uh, we take a break on Good Morning Nigeria for today. We we'll take a short break. When we come back, we'll continue with the conversation with the two uh, eminent ladies here with us as our guests. Do stay with us. All right, welcome back to the program. It's Good Morning Nigeria, live on the network service. Uh, just before we continue our conversation, we would like to remind you uh, that today the suspended CBN governor, Godwin M. Mayfeli, and two others are expected to be arraigned at the FCT High Court here in Abuja. Our judiciary correspondent, uh, head of judiciary desk, uh, Tunde Atumbi, is joining us now. Dele Atumbi, I beg your pardon, is joining us live uh, from the court's premises. Uh, Dele, I just, I just christened you, Tunde Atumbi. Uh, how are you doing and what, uh, what's happening at the moment? Well, at the moment, we are at the High Court of the Federal Capital Territory in Metama, where the suspended governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Godwin Omefiele, and two others are expected to be arraigned. And who, what are the things that we expect to happen today? Three things are expected to happen in today's proceedings. The first one will be the arraignment, where the 20 counts charge will be read to all the, uh, the defendants in this matter. And the second thing that will happen is that they will equally take their plea and after their plea, the bail application will now come up. We, it is a known fact that bail application is at the discretion of the court. It is not, at, it is not something that anybody can double into. The, courts, the, the, the truth of the matter is that this matter is a billable offense. However, it is equally at the discretion of the court. Who are the parties in this matter? The first party is the federal government. And the federal government is the prosecution, and the federal government is prosecuting this matter through the office of the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice. And the defendants are uh, the suspended Central Bank Governor, Godwin Emefile, who is the first defendant. We equally have uh, Saada Yaro, who is the second defendant. And as at the time of the award of this contract, which is being prosecuted, uh, the, the, uh, Saada Yaro or is a staff of the Central Bank of Nigeria. And the firm, the third defendant is the firm we are Saada to Yaro as uh, uh, business interests. Whether the Central Bank, uh, the suspended Central Bank uh, governor knew that Saada to Yaro had interest in that, com in that firm which the contract was awarded to is a different ball game. But it's been the, the, the three of them will be, uh, will be arranged today on, on, on this matter. And the, uh, the, the contract 
runs to 6.9 billion naira and those they are expected to take their plea on this matter today it will be recalled that last week the arraignment was uh, the arraignment was to be to be to be made however because of the ill health of the second defendant the arraignment could not uh, was told or could not go ahead okay uh, 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 Dele, just lead us into uh, some of the offenses you said the 20 count charge uh, which is just uh, many, but just a few of the key ones, you know, so that Nigerians can also understand, but many uh, don't understand uh, really what are the key issues. So what are these people being persecuted for? Just uh, in, 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 in brief. Uh, on the, the matters that have been raised there is that uh, Amy Philly, the suspended governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, used his office unduly to award a contract uh, to the tune of 6.9 billion naira and it has to do with purchase of vehicles you know under the Pro procurement act there are procedures and it has been alleged that the second defendant who was a, uh, a staff of the central bank of nigeria and uh, has a business interest with the firm in which the 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 the, the, the contract was awarded to and you are not expected to do that, but it is now left for the court to decide whether yes or no, but it is everything, the 20 count charge can be termed as being in the realm of allegations. Uh, Dele, I, I, I don't know if uh, uh, you have an answer to this question. What are the considerations of the uh, judges for the exercise of the discretion? And are all the defendants uh, in court today? Well, for now, we've not seen any of the defendants in court because uh, as at last week, even smartly too, Emefili was dodging the eye of the camera. And uh, the, the discretion of the court, if you say something is at the discretion of the court, the court may say yes, the court may say no to a bail application. But eventually, one of the reasons why the court may say no to uh, a bail application is that if the defendant is a flight, is a flight risk, and on that the, the, the court may not grant the bail application. But uh, this is not something we should dwell on because it is at the discretion, the discretion of the court. The court may grant it, the, crown, the court may not grant it. We get that. Uh, Dela Tombi, we'd like to thank you uh, for sharing a situation at the court with us here on Good Morning Nigeria. Thank you indeed. Uh, well, of course, we're we going to be tracking the events there, perhaps in our uh, subsequent uh, news or programs. All right, um, once again, we're back to the studio to continue our conversation. Uh, earlier on, you know, uh, uh, signed off uh, former governor of uh, Kano State. But whatever, you know, emergency that was there, he has cancelled it. So he's back again <laughs> on the beach with us. So there was one question I asked you earlier on, you. Uh, yes. which has to do yes. with the budgeting. To yes. say, look, you have a project of one mil of 100 million naira, mm -hmm. and you have about 25% of that budget allocation given to you yeah, yeah. and your target is to achieve the objective of uh, the administration how do you manage such situation because you, uh, when you mentioned that i want to believe quite frankly yeah. that has also affected many projects in yeah. different ministries yeah. you know in the country but i think you see the idea of budgeting is largely a projection some anticipation and where we always make the mistake is we, government being over ambitious. You see, uh, when you decide to uh, think of a project, you have not considered the resources available. You just think, okay, I want to do X, Y, Z. And when the resources come, you still don't cut corners with your project. That's why we end up with many abandoned projects. A project of 10 billion, and you know 10 billion is not coming, but you still insist and award the contract at 10 billion with the, uh, well, I wouldn't say silly hope of 
the rain would come, that in the end, this 10 billion would come uh, in your dream. And by the time you even finish your tenure, the 10 billion has not come, but you have given the award, you have started the contract, the contractor will abandon it because there is no payment. You see, our failure to really uh, project policies and programs within the reality of what you have. I told kind of people, look, if your money is 10 million, I'll give you a project of 10 million and go. For eight years, we have not taken any loan from anywhere, whether internal or external. Mm. And still so, so people are happy. We identified some specific areas. I realized that Kano is such a very large cosmo cosmopolitan city, the problem of lack of water to drink. So I identified from day one, I started saving money for a new brand water works. By the time we spent two, three years, I've assembled all the billions I wanted. And I awarded a project of a water world of 150 million liters, the biggest in West Africa today. You know, you know, so you, you yes. that was proper planning. Mm -hmm. I saved the money before I even awarded the contract. Your Excellency, that's, yes. that's again, you know, prioritizing, prioritizing. You know, yes, your, your, your targets yeah, exactly. and, and giving timelines and indicators yes. so you tick off and all that. Yes. Thank you, th thank you very much, Your Excellency, yes. and um, of, of course, and thank you also for you for for deciding to remain with us for the concluding part <laughs> of our conversation. Yes, let thank me you. let me bring in uh, Jim <coughs> Seminatari, uh, you know, from Port Port Harcourt, who's joining us via Zoom. Ibim, again, I, I'm I'm looking at you know three three four ministries: a humanitarian ministry, uh, labor and employment ministry, the FCT. Uh, uh, and of course, probably education. I don't know. In, we have very few uh, short time to round off our conversation. But on the papers this morning, we heard that states are already um, warehousing rice, which is meant to be, you know, distributed as palliatives, and that's very critical because it, the, the president was emphatic, you know, on what should be done uh, with these palliatives. The Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs is the ministry designated, you know, for this, yes. And, and one of the key challenges is the parameters for distribution. The minister, new minister has her responsibilities cut out. What are your advice for her? With regards to the rice gone to states, it's I think it's just criminal if truly um, something is sent and people choose to warehouse it and not distribute it. But maybe they're trying to figure out um, how they want to do it. I, I, I don't know. Uh, but for the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, I agree with you, she has her work cut out for her. And um, one of the biggest things that she wants to look at is the kind of crisis Nigerians are facing right now. It is very important that um, she, of course, working with um, those in her ministry, looks again at the policies uh, uh, that have to do with social infrastructure, uh, delivery of social dividends to the people that have been in the past and see which of those um, might, you know, this administration might benefit from. Uh, that's very important, uh, looking at track record and working from backwards forwards. But uh, that's just one aspect. A greater aspect would be to define in line with the mandate of the ministry how she wants to go about making a statement, how she wants to go about touching the poorest of the poor, but also how she wants to ensure that the policies uh, uh, of this government uh, with regards to helping um, the poorest of the poor are implemented seamlessly. Uh, so that requires um, uh, empathy, but as well as um, ad administrative acumen that would enable her uh, deliver this. I think that one of the key things she must do is keep her eyes on um, translating policy to action. 
so that she's not big on talk and short on action. She's got to see how to move this thing from paper to actual lives because her ministry is one where the people must feel the impact. It's not just hear the millions. She's got to also go beyond tokenism, which is something that um, public office tends to do, where we give out tokens of uh, little brown envelopes and it doesn't go anywhere. She's got to ask herself, whatever it is that we are doing as policy, it must translate to seeing um, a, a groundswell of, of the people changing. There should be a change in the lives of Nigerians because of the things we have done. So that if this investment is not translating to profit, and I mean profit in the sense of seeing actual dividends in the lives of Nigerians, then maybe the investment is not worth it. We, we don't want to hear that billions have been expended and yet we can't see it in the lives of the people. Uh, we also have to in that ministry be sure that we're looking at crisis prone areas so what is happening in the northeast how are we going in there what is happening in in areas when there is flood? how are we going there if there are flood if we have flood in please states, uh, we would like to I, I appreciate you uh, once more so you know we, we are trying to manage time that, that we have you know so i can conclude the program we, you, you've made your point and uh, i want to say a few things that you mentioned uh, administrative acumen that is required for instance in fct do we know the number of widows in fct you have the data of those who are poor the poorest of the poor in it is it possible to get that done it's not part of it so that when you are sharing you know whom you're giving i want to appreciate you once more for being with us this morning and good morning nigeria ibim seminitari i'm struggling with that name former commissioner for information river state and former md of uh, nddc it's been wonderful having you this morning on our show now back to the studio here um uh, is, it, is it nigerians we, we, we like vocabularies or what should i say uh what is a uh, trending globally we're talking about blue economy we have a green economy you know we talk about rct you know these are things we'd like to talk about but again you mentioned something uh, you know at the beginning of your of our conversation you said the pedagogy i'm learning that word for the first time i mean that has to do with starting from where you know if i'm right from what you know to what you don't know yes. for for instance yeah you know for instance we have neglected homegrown technology that we can do by ourselves we rely on importing virtually everything 90 percent of all electrical electronics the machinery we import them into this country when we have people with capacity to produce those things they will have the raw materials to get these things done they're not done what should these ministers do now to echo uh, uh, meaning from our life we have capacities that we're not harnessing them Everything you have said you know, dives into the issue of what do we do to grow our economy. At the end of the day, it's about growing our economy. That's the big elephant in the room right now. Uh, let me quickly talk on the issue of palliative yes, because I think you're very... You have to do that mm, in, uh, a, uh, in a gif. Yeah. Now, palliatives is a very sensitive thing. I, I don't know what the uh, Honorable Minister has in mind, but she must not she must tell herself that she cannot be known as a poster child for saying every child every household has received help meanwhile every household has suffered she must put her boots on the ground leadership is not about rhetorics the book when the book ends on your table you must be able to take responsibility for your failure or for your success and yeah. so when these palliatives which are daily needed by nigerians are going out it's very important to see that they're actually utilized again the issue of the economy we must structure our loans so that we have resources that will go around realistically we can't borrow to to um, sustain our budgets, we must prioritize sure. ministries. I'm, I'm looking must, at I'm, yeah, at uh, your time. I'm, no, no land. land. I'm yeah, we must prioritize the ministries that that will put that will run this economy. We must drive this economy. Where we we don't even have forex. We're hearing about three point something billion for our forex reserves. We must know what's going on with CBN. We cannot be treating problems when it is late. A CBN governor must be open and we must know what is going on with the CBN. Everybody's portfolio actually knows dives into the other person's Com portfolio. Com Comrade Gloria, I've, I've given you more than enough <laughs> time to land. Yeah. I just allowed the, uh, uh, His Excellency to just give us a final a closing remark 
your no. yes your well, I piece of work my, my closing remarks and my advice to all the honorable ministers is that they must be sincere they must be exemplary in their conduct they must do what they say and uh, identify priorities and carry the staff along with them carry the very scheduled officers along with them and respect due process. I like that. Respect due process. Uh, former Governor of Kanu State, former Minister of Education, former Senator, His Excellency Malam Ibrahim Sheikh Rao. I am going to appreciate you finally at this time. Thank you very much Thank for finding you. time to join us. Thank we you. look forward to having you again because uh, you. this conversation uh, will be on for days and weeks to come. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, let me also appreciate uh, Comrade Gloria Okolubo, former Commissioner for Multilateral Relations and Energy Delta State, a very energetic comrade, uh, very passionate about, uh, uh, of course, uh, what she believes in. Earlier on, we uh, appreciated Ibim Seminatari, former Commissioner for Information, River State, and former MD, NDDC. And uh, so, as we said earlier, this conversation will be on uh, for some time to come. We'll intend to keep at it. Kira. All right. And uh, it's said that uh, we uh, conclude our program for today we hope you enjoyed uh, watching the program as we have enjoyed presenting it to you we'll return again tomorrow for another package i am kirian umaya see you again i'm claire adelabu abdurazak to have a pleasant day we'll see you again soon